Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. So glad you're all here. You're in for another treat. I, I say that every week, but I think when we leave, everybody agrees that it's uh, that way. Today, our presenter is Johnny Jones, and he is not going to play music for us. He's going to present his bird photographs. He's going to explain how he got interested and how it brought him into a connection to our creator through his creation. Johnny Jones was born in Hopewell in 1953 to Howard and June Walton Jones. He's lived here most of his life. He's married to Debbie Jones. He's been married to her for 41 years. He has two children who are here, Daniel Jones of Hopewell and Megan Jones Wright, who is from Marietta, Georgia. Graduated from Hopewell High School in 1972, went to Richard Blaine College and VCU, where he graduated with a BS in business. He worked in banking for 41 years, and he recently retired, and is currently working part-time as a waymaster at Advent 6. Recently, he renovated and with his wife and moved into the old Peter Epps house on Brown Avenue in Hopewell. He's currently a member of West End Presbyterian Church, where he leads music. He's on the board of the John Randolph Foundation and serves as treasurer of the Hopewell Food Pantry. He formerly served as treasurer of the historic Hopewell Foundation and the Hopewell Rotary. Past president of the United Way and the Hopewell Prince George Chamber of Commerce. Wow, he's, he's been a very busy man. Besides his love of baseball and music, Johnny has long enjoyed photography. He was fortunate that God brought several people into his life that encouraged this interest. Ed Hatch, Kenny Tomko, and Charlie Hunter. Ed is a wildlife and landscape artist. Kenny bought, bought Ed his first Roger Torrey Peterson bird book, and Charlie has always kept him abreast of birds that he has found and where they were. They have made numerous excursions in pursuit of new species. So, I'm very pleased to introduce you, John Jones. Please enjoy. I got a little all that stuff. So I don't have much else to say. We just share the pictures. But now, I uh, always think it's interesting uh, if you have a hobby. If y'all know, I usually have a little ensemble of musicians, and we do music for y'all every year. And it's been so well attended. I mean, we used to pack that room. And I was just lucky to have a good fiddlers and mandolin players. We did have a lot of fun doing that. But with COVID, it's just really hard to bring those people together to do something like that. So I've always had this. I was telling uh, David, I remember me and Debbie going to uh, Herm, Herm, Herndon and Louise Smith's house. Bless their hearts, wonderful people that both passed away. They actually did this one night just for fun with them. And, but anyway, I uh, want to thank AJ for a second. My history goes back. I was their worst treasure. I was probably the worst one they ever had. And I kept listening to all those acknowledgments. I said I was probably the worst one of those presidents and everything they've ever had in any of those organizations. But, you know, I, it did, you know, you just kind of do what you did. Sometimes uh, you, it was your turn to serve. But uh, anyway, but uh, Ann Robbins is somebody I guess very much. I guess I had talked to her a couple of days before she passed about doing my program. And I told Nancy Burr when I came in, you two are like the bookends, you know, and it's like you only got one book now. But uh, I've known those ladies forever, and it just, you know, just unbelievably wonderful people. So anyway, I do want to thank them, and thank the people that keep historical Hopewell going. I want to thank them for selling me that house on Brown Avenue. We, we spent a ton of money, but we love it there. And anytime you ride by, you can see you want to smile on the porch. Debbie would love to show your unfitted kitchen. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so I would just like to really go back to what she was saying. Uh, you know, I had a guy that was obsessed with softball and some of the things I was. And, uh, I did. So probably about 1872 a year, I was in an English class, and I was with a guy named Ed Hatch, and we were probably striving to get our C so we could graduate from high school because neither one of us had any interest in English. But uh, I found that Ed had this really good ability to draw it. I remember him trying to get me to draw it with Bobby Mercer baseball guy. I don't know what happened to that. But, but we kind of, it really was strange is that Ed and I ended up, after that year, got formed. They, we were both playing for different church league softball teams. 
And some guy decided we're going to pick these guys from different teams and have a tournament team. And Ed was the left fielder, I was the left center fielder. And if y'all don't know Ed Hatch, you, you know, you should, because Fred out of Birdsville and catch him at the studio. He's got like a 50% off weekdays. But Ed, 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 so here we were playing outfield together. He was left center. I, was like, I don't think I've ever played with anybody in the outfield that we could read each other so well. And I, I would have just dared anybody to try to get one between us. We, we were both that kind of competitive. But then he got smart and started doing other things. But, Got into his art career, so I will give Ed a lot of credit for. We just loved camping and stuff, and I guess uh, eventually we kind of came across. It's funny how you meet one friend that leads you to another friend. I had a friend Mark Patterson that knew Charlie Hunter. If y'all knew Catherine Hunter and Roy Hunter, and uh, they just did a sign. And Charlie's here, so but uh, so Charlie kind of had a lot of the same interests we did. We, so I, you know, my friend Mark Patterson, I was long gone, but I'm still great friends with Charlie. I mean, these guys. Those two guys are like brothers to me. You know, we've we done a lot together years, but Charlie, Charlie's famous for sending the e-birds and where the various things are spotted. But, uh, but I'll never forget, you know, Charlie and Ed and I decided to go camping on the Shenandoah. Ed was going to, I was probably at the land, I don't know, but, and Ed was going to Old Dominion. He brought a camera with him. And that just really struck our interest. We did all kinds of, I, I wish I could have found some of those photos that you could have shared with we just kind of had a lot of fun playing the camera. So I got obsessed about one, one of those Canon E ones that were coming out at the time. So eventually I got one of those. And back in those days, you took slides and stuff. But uh, the game has always changed. So that's kind of how I got involved in that kind of thing as far as wanting to do photography, play with photography. But uh, anyway, um, and I do have this camera. And I, I don't want to speak more to it later, but it, you know, again, I kind of. It's not a really, well, it's sort of expensive, but it's not expensive. It could be. I kind of shoot everything with that on my, and I'll explain a little bit more about that later. But, uh, so, eventually I get married to this wonderful Prince George girl, and I go to West End Presbyterian, and I meet a guy named Kenny Tomko, and Kenny's back there. He's an environmental engineer, retired from over at Band 6, and, and Kenny had a real love for that kind of stuff. So, anyway, one day Kenny presents me with this book. It's so like the field guide to birds. I still use it. I bought the wrong run there. You know, what I, the, the hard copy has all when he gave it to the date, but he gave this book right before Peterson. And so, if anybody really wants to get into identifying birds, that's the bird. That's still a way to go. In my opinion. So, we had that. And this is a strange bird. And I'll talk to you about that later. But, uh, but anyway, so anyway, so Kenny, he just had a kindred spirit when he came to outdoors as well. And, so I, I've always appreciated Kenny for starting me with, hey, I guess I should identify these things. You know, so. But anyway, I'm going to jump into as cameras. I, I was a hardcore, I'm not going to go to the digital cameras, but when I realized you could take a thousand pictures, and maybe one of them would be good, uh, and, and storm, I ended up going to Canon. So this basically is a full frame, kind of a low end, probably be considered professional, but it's not. You could spend. I probably you probably get this for a thousand to uh, fifteen hundred bucks. And what I would tell you, if you really were serious about taking photos, I'd get rid of that. I'd just buy the body. I'd buy your, I'd buy your own lenses as you want, the kind of lenses you want. I don't have samples of them, but what I do, I have a little fifty millimeter lens. I have an eighty to eight, is it seventy or eighty to two hundred can and dice lens. But this is the one that really I, I spend most of my time. on. John's good to see you. Anyway, uh, so anyway, I just kind of give you an idea. Uh, this lens is all busted up now. I've got plenty of reasons out there, but it still takes a good picture. Um, and all that Daniel will tell you, it takes a macro. Uh, that's why this is interesting. I found out, took a shot of a dragonfly. There's that depth of field that you find, because this thing shoots at a real low depth, because everything around it kind of gets glazed. So it kind of makes a neat picture. So. I sort of realized it real quick. I've got something I can do quite a few different things with. Um, I'm going to let Daniel go to the nature picture. So this was uh, just an idea. I, I sort of realized I'm going to take a picture of a dragonfly. All right. It's called a blue dasher. Yeah, two different pictures of And that's a Bonet I painted 
I got you. <laughs> I did rip off some Renee. They used to say people in gets to paint this stuff. But anyway, uh, anyway, that's kind of, I don't know, that's just go to the next one, Daniel. And this is a uh, cloud of sulfur, I think. You know, I realized real quick there's just tons of varieties of uh, dragonflies right around. And the same thing about butterflies, you just don't realize how many butterflies are in your area. I probably have 35 different, different butterflies in my time. That's almost all another presentation. But I want to give you an idea, but the thing is, I sort of find it I can do with this camera. We'll go to the next one. And again, this was a uh, dragonfly down at Lake Harrison. And I just looked at that and I started seeing the details of that. That's why I call that like a uh, proof of God lens. I'm thinking, my gosh, you know, who designed that? And it's just incredible. <laughs> really, it's incredible. Uh, go to the last one. I think it's just one more. And that's sort of a, a, da a damsel fly. So they, what you call cattle country, blue, blue or something. So anyway, so, and okay, this is the last one. I said, but there's flowers for you too. Okay. It's up there on the board, I think. But everybody knows off the bed what kind of flower that is? Somebody said passion flower, right? I didn't know what it was. I took that out of Lake Harrison one day. And I, and I thought, it looks like an old space module. You know, it's going to fly my spaceship. And so anyway, I, had, I started realizing this camera really makes you look at the world differently. What's right around you, the little simple things around you that it's there. So anyway, so that's kind of where I kind of fell in love with that lens. And, uh, you know, wherever people doing something else. I'm over there shooting crazy things with my camera to see what I get. Um, so anyway, we'll jump into, I found out next. So um, this is a sports. Uh, let's see which one. So I didn't realize that it was being sports so well. So I went to visit my daughter out in Seattle. We went to a rodeo. And I was literally sitting in the top of the bleachers on the other side of where the horses and stuff came out. And shot that rodeo. I mean, I got constant shots like this, you know. Um, and uh, I don't know if they got lit, <laughs> but, uh, but it was just incredible. And I thought, well, you know, I can shoot a couple of football games with that. So, is there another picture after that? So I started shooting over there. Now, I actually had a nice shot of John Lottie sleeping at the time. <laughs> Joseph, I mean. So Joseph fell asleep, and they had, and uh, that's why he was supposed to be here. <laughs> And so there's, there's Joseph scrambling at a college scale game. I think he threw an interception. And this, this is one of my favorite shots ever. It's, it's Trey Henderson in the playoff game against Goochland. I mean, he was so far ahead of everybody. Nobody was around him. He's just cruising to the end zone. And so, yeah, that's all. That's always been one of my favorite football shots. But, but I'm, you know where I'm standing? I'm at the top of the bleachers on the other side of the field. And I shoot that. And then what I do is I crop it. You know, and I'm still getting that kind of fall. I said, that's why I said I love that lens. And so I thought I could do sports too. So we'll get to why we're here. This is my bird picture. It's all right. Uh, let's go to the, uh, what did I tell you, Dan? We'll start with uh, my bird picture. My lens. Oh, here we go. So I'm going to go to, as far as birds, I'm going to start in our backyard. Uh, I don't know how many of y'all pay attention. I was sitting in the yard today. And just uh, seeing what came in there. But this time of year, you still get kind of the same birds all the time. But I'll just start with some birds you probably would see in your yard now. I'm a big proponent of, city, of the city of Hopewell re putting cedar trees on Cedar Lane because I had a cedar tree when I lived on Cedar Lane across from St. John's, and it was a great nesting place for a morning dove. So, again, the more they can put some cedar trees back along that road, which is called Cedar Lane, and, and I lived there. So anyway, that's a picture of a morning dove. Go to the next one, Daniel. Now this is more like on my fence line, but again, the the, the beauty that's in those birds, it's incredible. And so it's just a morning dove that you hear them cooing a lot and things like that. Go to the next one. And not probably about six months ago, I'm in my backyard, maybe I don't know, maybe it was last or something. And I see this bird fly across my backyard right there down on the ground. And a barred owl was in the tree, so I kind of took a shot. Uh, and then they take it eight times. Just every once in a while, you get a shot like that, it just kind of falls in the air. They don't stay in my yard every day. Um, go ahead. And I thought some blue jays. I, I, I found one thing if you really want to attract blue jays, put, put down the hair, they, they have uh, non, non, they have these peanuts you can buy in sacks that are not for human purposes. 
I just throw a bunch of peanuts out there. And there's blue jays. They kind of like they wait on me every morning, I think. Uh, but it's good because I have probably, you know, we usually have those for supper that night. And uh, I, I was telling that Debbie, I was listening to a guy named Wayne Henderson, who was a guitar picker. He was telling jokes on some of the things I saw the other day. He was talking about a lady that uh, went to the church that he did. The church up, this was up in the mountains, they lived out in the country. And he noticed when he got to the table spread, she had a baked chicken, barbecue chicken, fried chicken, grilled chicken, chicken and dumplings, chuckered pot pie. He goes, man, they sure served a lot of chicken here. So after the whole ate, you know, he said, uh, they sat on the porch, just let their food settle. And he goes, I noticed this chicken came around the house. And kind of all of a sudden, the chicken started weaving through the yard, started to stumble, and just dropped over and died right there in front of me. He said, what's, he goes, what's wrong with your chickens? He says, I don't know, but they're dying faster than we eat them. So, <laughs> yeah, very good at the blue chain, man. <laughs> you go, Pastor. All right, here's one of my favorites. It, 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 the Carolina Red, if you can get those in your yard. There are your songbirds, man. I'll tell you, there's a beautiful singer. I used to swear if I put my guitar in the backyard and sing, they would all come around and sing with me. But they're just an incredible species. Uh, and usually, if you got a canoe in the yard, they'll be up in into your canoe making a nest. Um, but uh, one of my true favorites, Carolina Red, this one. The next one, Dan. Make sure I'm not taking too much time here, okay? And that's a cat bird. If you should get those around in case, I seem like they come and go, but uh, very much similar to a mockingbird and uh, in the way they can make sounds. They do make a little bit of like a cat sound sometimes, but uh, some people haven't really heard that, but ooh, it's a little blurry, but anyway. I don't, I'm not trying to show all my birds. You, know, you, you can take a ton of bird pictures and go to the next one, Daniel. And, and some of them are cleaner than other ones. And this is one of my favorites. And another reason you keep a cedar tree in cedar lanes because this is not a cedar tree, but those cedar, cedar wax wings love to come to those cedar trees when they come through and migrate. They get in flocks. And something that I saw on the YouTube with something about cedar wax wings is pretty interesting. In this case, there was plenty of food for all of them. Let's say there's only food for one. They would actually rotate who goes in and eats and who doesn't. So they're, they're really an incredible bird, one of the most beautiful. And uh, you don't usually get that kind of shot, but I had a little tree on Cedar Lane that had tons of these berries. And they, there must have been 20 of those birds in there. Go mm -hmm. to the next one, Daniel. Uh, now, you don't get much meat off of this one. Uh, <laughs> but this is the chickadee. Uh, uh -huh. and, uh, Good thing about them, they come pretty close to you, so you can get some really good pictures of them. Uh, that was on Cedar Lake, too. Go ahead, Dan. Now, this is what, that's the food source for this one. Uh, anyway, that's a, I think it would be an immature a Cooper's Hall. Uh, sometimes you got to look, if you look at a Cooper's Hall, as they mature, that stripe goes away. So that one's just, and that one's actually behind the chapel. I was in the yard over there at Brown Avenue last summer. I hear all the birds started scattering. And when you see that, you go, something's going on here. So sure enough, uh, that, that guy flew in the tree. And, and I told him, could you just stay there while I go get my camera? And let me take a few pictures. I mean, he did. He was thoughtful. But just the next picture you're not going to like. But anyway, this is a Cooper's Hawk Mature. And if uh, Yellow Belly Sap Sucker, that yeah, was his lunch. But he nailed it. I heard a little, that's over in the gardens behind, here been that garden behind. I heard something rustling over there. I went over and sure enough, the Cooper's Hawk had knocked a yellow belly sap sucker down. And uh, anyway, I thought, every once in a while, you get a shot like that. Go to the next one, Dan. Ooh. And this is called a cowbird. And they'll come through the yards to, to my feeder uh, occasionally. And uh, you see them a lot. They call them cow because you see the cow here. But one of the traits of them, supposedly, they'll go take over some other birds and ask, hey, go build a nest and then we'll come in. Anyway, but they're they're an interesting. They got an eagle sound, but they, they definitely will roll in. Uh, and very kind of small blackbird. Next one. And I have always called these dark eyed juncos, but I think they're technically called northern juncos. Who what would y'all know them as? Snowbirds. Snowbirds, good. Yeah, that's when that's when you know it's winter. You see these guys show up and uh, beautiful little bird. Next one. And these are a pest bird. Went out of Charlie's house, and these guys only showed up once in a while. Charlie, what did you call that reason they were down here this year? These are evening grosbeaks, by the way. It's called an eruption year up north. Yeah. So 
and in Russia, you had cheese. Yeah. So we had birds come into the area that we normally wouldn't see, and that was one. Charles, I didn't get them in Oakland. Some of y'all out the country and maybe different places got them. I hadn't seen one in maybe, which Ed, maybe 25, 30 years had we? Yeah, at least 20 years. Yeah, and uh, so it was just a real joy. I went to Charlie's house and sat in the jar with him and uh, took pictures of them all day. I got a pretty good shot there of one of them. They're just, and believe me, they're kind of a bigger fish type bird and just beautiful color. Uh, but anyway, so we were really blessed with having those guys show up. Go to the next one. And these are your normal gold finches that are hanging. That's probably a, probably in the fall or something, because usually they mold different times of some of the finches. They don't get the yellow for a while. But anyway, I always kind of like that picture for some reason. Next one. And that's one that would actually a gold finch. I didn't like it that he went this, because yellow and pink don't go to win us. It's not a very, you know, a, a pleasing, you know, pleasing photo in just the paint. I need a better, find a better flower. But anyway, beautiful sure. birds, beautiful. Now, Charlie griped about the even grosbeaks wiping his feeder duck over there in, in French George where he lived. I was having these rats, these grapples wiping me. I said, I'll trade you any day of the week for evening grosbeaks for these guys. But these guys are incredibly smart. If you have a, if you have like a, oh, what do you call them? Water, the, the feeders, the water bowls out in your yard, what do you call them? Yeah. Uh, bird baths, yeah. If you have a bird bath near these guys and you have peanuts, they'll take a peanut, let it soak in that bird bath, and then go ahead and give me. So they're incredibly smart and they're just interesting birds. Go ahead. And that's a female house finch. Sometimes I just think, you know, even though these the, the males have all these colors, I think just the plain beauty of a, even, even a nondescript bird like that is just awesome. Um, and this is just the house sparrow. This is the female. Again, not the most prettiest thing in the world, but when you start really looking at the details, they're, it's incredible. <coughs> and it had gotten into my marijuana patch right there. Uh, 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 now, one thing I found this year, if you go to Randall Market, he's always got those cheap apples in there. You know, they, that you can buy for like a dollar, get six of them. I started taking apples and just sticking them on a nail right there on the side of the yard. And I got a few of these mockingbirds. I thought it was a great shot. This mockingbird just hung out there. And I get mockingbirds, cardinals, all of them come up and lean on that apple. Uh, so that's kind of a, another way to attract something. How do you think just go ahead next. Now, this is another one from the interruption. These, these guys seem to follow the evening grow speaks that Charlie said something. Charlie kept telling me he had some kind of fence in the yard. I said, Charlie, I believe that. Like, I've never seen one, but it reminds me of the pine system. And it's called a pine system. So that was kind of like a whole new species this year. So, anyway, uh, beautiful uh, fish like bird. So, I was thrilled to get that onto the charts. And there's the male. And that's a house finches and purple finches. You got the only way you can tell there's like there's something to do with the tail. But there you can't really see the tail. So I don't know. I won't call it a purple finch just because who's gonna tell me, you know? <laughs> Anyway, um, so and uh, there's another uh, oh, when I was in Charlotte, my daughter lived in Charlotte for a while, this red shouldered hawk just kinda hung around her backyard and again he was kinda like, hey, come take some ducks up uh, obviously, there was something there to eat that he uh, was pretty interested in. So, very rare you would get a shot like that, at least from me. Go ahead. And another guy that loves peanuts when they're in, in town is the uh, red bellied woodpecker. A lot of people think this is redhead. If you know a redhead's got full red head, these are red bellied. I mean, I think the male may have a little more red. This must be a maybe an immature young one. But again, a beautiful bird. And uh, again, they love those peanuts. Now, again, yeah, one of my favorites that I used to hardly ever see is a, a red breasted, uh, is it a road breasted or red breasted? It's red breasted. Nuthatch. Now, there's three types of nuthatches around right here. One of them you see more common is the white breasted. And if you go down towards Sussex and maybe around the ponds, there's a brown headed nuthatch. This little guy was at my feeder for like half a year this year, this red breasted. And he, and he would fly in within three feet of you and he'd hold the feeder. Uh, a little small uh, nuthatch. Beautiful bird, and uh, the first time I, I hadn't seen one in a year, the first time I ever remember seeing one, Kenny, was when we were looking at that property out there off of Route 10, and we were walking in those ravines, and there was one that day. And I, I hadn't seen that many since, but all of a sudden they're showing back up. And they may be part of this interruption. I have no idea what that is. Uh, and why is that my hummingbird feeder? 
that, it's been hard for me to get a decent shot. It's probably the best hunting bird shot I've gotten. And uh, I'll show you another one that another group is sitting here in a minute. Let's go ahead. And this one's very elusive as far as trying to take a picture of. I've taken so many pictures of this guy. Probably one of the prettiest birds out there, but because of that black head, it's got a red eye, it's a rufous side of the toe. Uh, they like brush and they like uh, like thickets. So you don't see them sometimes unless you have those. And they have a unique sound, and I kind of know when they're around. But, so it's still one of my favorites. Some of the most elusive to try to take a picture of. Go ahead. Song sparrows, again, they have a beautiful little song. And they kind of like uh, marshes and stuff. But uh, one thing about them and the Rufus Satatoe, it seems like wherever I see Rufus Satatoe, I see song sparrows. I always wondered. I have this theory that certain birds like to follow certain breeds, certain species, and maybe they don't. It seems like a, wherever I see song sparrows, you might see a toe. So, but, uh, but I even think that about, I think, for the reason you might see, a lot more birds around a bird feeder instead of the wild. And I think they like to have company. And they, no doubt that the grackles and the, I can put those, I can, I would, I can go outside and not see anybody around and throw those peanuts down. And within 30 minutes, every grackle and blue jay in the area is in my feeder. So they've either got their FaceTime or something. I don't know. <laughs> they do, but, it's, but they do seem to have an unusual ability of uh, people. Go to the next one. Um, now, this is not a very good picture, but you might see this in your. Uh, an albino starling. One year on the back line, it was an albino starling was in the back there. And so I didn't get a very good picture of it. Anyway, you never know what might show up. I don't know if anybody ever seen an albino starling. I know a lot of people just seen all the starlings go back to Europe, but uh, they're actually called European starlings. And they're not natural to here. Like, go to the next one. But they are beautiful. I mean, you really look at some of the details of the starling. Um, and they molt during the year, too, so you get all kinds of weird colors. But again, these are just samples of things that have come through my yard over the time, and we're probably getting close to the end of them. Go ahead, next one. And that's a great little bird. They come, they kind of hang around the, the chickadees, in my opinion. They seem to come here about the same time. This one I've been to, I've got a pedigree. Is it pedigree? What do you call it? Just telling me how it's going to He went and got his blue that day. It's kind of, I thought it was kind of pretty. Anyway, go to the next one. And that one I shot up there. But I just thought the color was, I mean, it was just a nice shot. So. Next one. And that's the white breasted nuthatch. And another beautiful bird that, that we see during the winter here, especially as a white throat sparrow. And you really start looking at the detail, that little yellow and stuff. They are something else. And they, unfortunately, they're kind of clumsy. They drop the seeds a lot of times when they're trying to eat. Go to the next one. And that's a different picture of one. I found too that I find these stumps like that, and I'll just put a stump and throw food out. So these guys don't go to the feeders, but they like to hang around the bottom. But they'll come up on top of a log like that. So that it kind of gives you different angles, different different ways to get different birds. Uh, but anyway, I usually have to kind of nail that one down, and then I'll take a picture. Of it. I don't think they nail it. Go ahead. All right, let's go to. Uh, that was more or less just some things in the backyard. John, so, yes. Tell me why the female um, house uh, finch comes to the feeder and this crazy one, she'll sit there and go ch -ch 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 and pull all the seed up. Won't eat it. Yeah. Just throws it out. Maybe the white throat sparrows want some food on the ground. I don't know. I, <laughs> because I noticed uh, there's certain birds, that, you know, robins never come. Um, but they don't even, they'll feed around, but they usually still look for worms and stuff. How do you I, did, cope with I did show some of those birds. There's still more birds you'll see in the yard, but they got a different category. How do you cope with squirrels? I love them. I mean, I don't know, people, people are bothered by them, but I, there's another theory I have. I think the birds like the squirrels, and they, they, they communicate. I, I don't have that trouble. They go and get my peanuts, too, and they go eat on an apple. And actually, I have a little dog. Part of his game is to chase the squirrels. In the yard. So, <laughs> you know, Charlie and I talk about this. He's got the squirrels in his feeder. Some people can't say it. They'll shoot every one in the yard. I, mine don't tear all the stuff up. I, I like seeing squirrels, too. I, so, again, they, they kind of wipe you out sometimes. But anyway, I, I kind of have my allotment for the day, and I said, if not, you better go to the next feeder down the street. 
uh, so Dan Hill, let's see, here's the city point. So to give you an idea, looking down at city point, some of the pictures I've been able to take down there. And now, you know, obviously down there, right now you don't see them as you once did, but the bald eagles, you know, I've seen as many as six at a time flying over my house. And, uh, so there's a big sycamore tree in the parking lot there, city point area. They like to hang out on the other side of that. So during the winter, you can get cleaner shots right there, you have leaves and stuff. But you know, it's Charlie. I don't know how I talk about this. You know, when we were kids, we'd have been we'd have thought we'd up back on the hill to see Baldy. Now they're everywhere. But uh, let's go to the next one, son. And sometimes you get a shot like this. It's not real plain, but I like the way they're kind of flying there together. And, uh, I've got a lot of eagle shots, but these are just a couple of things. Go ahead. Uh, one morning, I was down at the dock. The sun had just come up and see it just great and was low and I just caught that picture silhouetted as mom and you know they're bringing the chicks across. I just liked it. So the Canadian geese they kind of hang out down there. Uh, the next one. Now FMX matter, you know, COVID stuff. The osprey was nesting there last year. I thought it was kind of funny. I'd be looking at the nest and they must have had some eagles still on the house. You'd see this stuff coming up through the nest. But uh, they were they were sticks all around there. They're not nesting there this year, so maybe they learned their lesson from last year. But the next thing, for those who, you know, maybe, John, you might want to leave the room for the next one. Oh, that's not, that's not the one I thought was coming. But I was on the point one day, and this guy flew by. So this, I take my camera out there almost every day, and very seldom you get somebody to fly by and see get a shot like that. So I want one of an eagle like that. Uh, and uh, what happened? Maybe it's going to be somewhere else. Okay. This is a, I think it's called a ring build. Greenville's all. It's, it was set on the dock down at City Point. But you know, the details of it. But there's the one I was going to say. This was the first movement in the Osprey called the Me Too movement. And uh, anyway, <laughs> that's, uh, I'm not sure what's getting ready to happen, but I, you know, I made sure all the children closed their eyes. But anyway, I, I thought that was such a great shot. This cloth could do some damage. Uh, anyway, excellent. Let's see. That was it. All right. So we'll go to Weston Manor if you don't mind. So I don't have a lot of shots from different places, but I used to go down to Weston and walk around sometimes. I have a few shots from there. Uh, I was down at the dock one day and these Connors came by me and I don't know. So I thought mm -hmm. that was kind of a neat shot. Uh, they fly up down the river, they stay very low, you know, they, so they always stay kind of that low plane. But they're kind of fun to watch, you know, how they die. They, they might come up a couple hundred feet from where they started. So next one. And of course, my, I, I keep saying these are my favorite, but this uh, golden crown penguins uh, are just beautiful. That was in some vines over there, right mm -hmm. off the banner. And one day I came out, I was sitting on the dock, and then something spluffed underneath the, uh, the, the dock down there. And, uh, and this uh, redhead came out of there, my canvas back, excuse me. And I wonder if sometimes it had a broken wing or something, but it's got a great picture of its eyes and stuff. So. Never seen one since, but I got one that day. And uh, this, I don't have a good picture of this one, but it's a black and white warbler, but I'm hoping it's going to be a little better than that. That was over at West. I guess go to Enrikis now. Now, one thing I wanted to just say for me as a bird is having a, the right kind of binoculars. Sometimes people get you like a 10 by 50, but they're great powerful, but you can't keep it, you can't keep it still enough. This is a little eight by forty-two. You can get them for dicks and something like a hundred bucks. But I'm telling you, this is, that's all you need. You don't need anything real powerful for girl watching. I think uh, that it's a game changer to have a nice little pair of binoculars where you can find the bird quickly and get a good picture of it. Anyway, the Henrikes is a great place to go look at birds. Uh, but during the winter, they really the, the pond they have when you come in there clears up. So you get these American coots and all these different ducks out there. So these are American coots. They got beautiful little red eyes as well. But they're always out there as little groupies. Okay, next one. And I got this one down, but the lighting was good and you kind of play with stuff. But uh, so you got this geese with these American ridges in front of them. So uh, anyway, uh, I always like that picture. And you know, when the ice is over, you get different types of shots. One of the goals of my future would be to be able to find more times to find birds landing and taking off. I've had some luck with that, but you 
you know, you can get the huge lenses. That probably would need to go to the big 400 big lens to really get shots of that. But anyway, I get what I get. So anyway, that's the Canadian geese. And this one's a little downy woodpecker. This is like one of the small woodpeckers. Um, beautiful little bird. Next. And I took another picture of a mockingbird there just because I like it. I like the, even those kind of nondescript the details of the wood it's sitting on and that kind of thing. And another beautiful little bird. And that one I was ever picture. I've had trouble taking a picture of a blackbird stuff. But if you get the right, take enough of them, maybe you get one like this. I, I really like this one. And yeah, sometimes them come into your feeders too. Is that the last one? I'm gonna go to just robins real quick, Dan. Yeah, we didn't do robins, you know, they're always here, sort of, at least this time of year in the yard. So I start with uh, this picture because, you know, usually they nest somewhere near your house, so this is just a picture. So go to the next one. This was one I nested. This picture I actually took up on the Shenandoah, but it was a next stage, sort of. I always thought it was a beautiful picture of a little baby robin or a young robin. And of course, this one I took recently. This is the one I sent to Ann Robbins the next one. And I told her, I said, I want to do something on birds. And uh, so they had some kind of little thing that came off a tree over at Papamax Manor. He kind of had it in his mouth. So anyway, the robins are easy to take pictures of. I got way too many of those photos of them. But anyway, beautiful little local bird. All right, let's see what we're going to do with the next thing. Let's go to the Shenandoah. One of the places that Ed and Charlie and I over the years enjoy is to plug the Shenandoah River. So we do go up there a lot. And uh, so you see a, some different stuff up there. And certain times of the year, you'll actually see these uh, common mergansers come down from Canada and will, you know, you know, nest and have, have young. And I was just at a little area where they were swimming near me. Uh, it's hard to get their picture too because you get that dark head, but really a beautiful bird. Next one. And the kingfisher, that's been a hard one for me to get to. I got lucky one morning, set it up on the power line near me. But uh, great bird and uh, fun to watch as they catch fish on the river and stuff. Go ahead. Now, this is called a little green heron. I got a feeling this was an immature one. For some reason, it didn't. The canoe went right by. He just kind of stuck there and walked like that. And, and it just, uh, it was just. Uh, still one of my favorites. I go to the next one. I might have one more shot. And then he had his hair up like that for some reason. So he didn't go to my bar. But Daniel, did he go to yours? I don't know. Um, but, uh, but it was just a, you know, I've been on that river tons of times, and that's the only time I've ever been able to get a shot like that. Most times they're a little more skittish. But that one, I don't know quite sure. I think, I think it was immature. Next one. And, uh, yeah, they are great. I don't know if you say Tilead or Tilead. Y'all call it whatever, but I always remember I had this uncle one time that used to make up the biggest lies, this wild stories. And he was staying here with one of my mom's sisters or something. I said, yeah, I got up and this huge, huge woodpecker was pecking with candy. And of course, it was probably this guy right here, but I don't know. Um, all right, next one. All right, here's probably the smartest girl in, bird in our country. This is a, a raven. And one day I was up in the Shenandoah. We went up near the Ray. There was an overlook in the Mass Center Mountains, like a little steel overlook. And it was a little bit of a breezy day. But these ravens started flying around. And I mean, they, they were really just having fun. And I think they were putting on an airship for us. So we had a real kick with that. And, uh, anyway, so we were uh, watching these ravens. But I'll tell you a couple of quick stories. You know, I've been doing a lot of, I like to watch a lot of YouTube. These guys are, Incredibly smart. There was a guy fishing up in like Alaska somewhere. He had an ice pond. And he'd go out and cut his hole in the ice and he was dropping his line in the pond every day. And he'd come back at night and he'd be fish on it. Yeah. And so, but he noticed every day his line would be out of the water, no fish. He said, man, I'm stealing my fish. So he decided I'd hide in the woods one day and watch it. These ravens, as soon as he put the, as soon as those ravens would see that line being pulled, on the uh, ice fish, it pulled up and they pulled a lot of things fish. <laughs> so, I mean, there's guys, and if you read that, that breed of bird, whether it's deer or some kind of off breed of it, they're just incredibly smart. Um, 
But that's sure the next one did. So they they were really doing like I was like I was watching the Blue Angels, you know. And so I had this shot of them, and the next one, that's the next one, before. and that's how they were flying by me. So again, I've been up there a ton of times. I'll probably never see this again, but it was, they, I did get some nice shots. Uh, great bird. And then one day I saw a bird in a tree. I had no idea what it was. It was way up in the tree. And I, I thought maybe they made these birds up. Anybody know what that is? There you go. Very good. Yellow bill cuckoo. So they do exist. And they come around here some, but that was the first time I ever got a shot of one and identified it. So I think we go to the next one right now. We're going to finish that one. Let's go to Florida. Went down to Florida a few times because uh, I kind of lived there for a short time as a kid. Merritt Island, right there near NASA, has a great wildlife reserve. And then uh, you can go to a couple other places. But the, yeah, you get to see some different birds. We went down there and kind of spent a week one time, Charlie and Ed and I, and another friend of ours, Jimmy Ang. And uh, I thought, I don't even know how to pronounce this one properly. It's called an American Antina or something like that. Mm -hmm. And hang them. But they, I think that one was shot near the St. John River, to be honest with you. I have another one that's on the uh, Silver River. Near Silver Springs, but what a neat bird! And then uh, the next one was this cattle acre. Uh, I guess it was on this little sandy road. Uh, it's just a gorgeous little bird. Uh, next one. And I know you see gray blue herons. I'm assuming this may be a little immature, that's why it's got some coloring. But I saw that like it's probably alligator bait. I mean, he'll probably he's not around anymore because alligators all over the river. But, but I, I kind of like that one because I got these purple flowers. So anyway, kind of one of my favorite great blue heron shots. You know, I've got a ton of these too, but that's probably my favorite. And uh, when I was in Merritt Island, this group of birds were in a tree, and so you've got everything from a snowy egret to a white egret to uh, the ibises. I'm not sure where the ibis is. There should be an ibis in here somewhere. But those uh, white egret. So I just thought it was kind of a neat shot to get those three different types of. And then we went to a place called Salt, Salt Lake or something. It's freshwater lake is called Salt Springs or something. You're down there, springs are all somewhere like that. The water temperature stays the same all year. It comes off, basically goes to the St. John's River. But we camped there, and uh, and there was a little area that is, uh, I guess they call us a little blue bear. So they had all kinds of, but what, we had a neat experience at this campground though, because we did was a little coquina rock. Go out, you could go out in that lake a little bit with our canoes, but it was a little uplifting or some coquina rock you could stand on out there. And the manatees would come like six inches from you. They just float by you. That was kind of a nice experience. But yeah, it was, uh, that was a nice trip. Uh, beautiful places down there. If you don't want to go to Disney World, I'll go to somewhere better than that. Anyway, next one. Now, one time I was down there by myself, I kind of went to it on the St. John's River, went to this little boat launch area. There weren't very many people there, but I kept noticing this uh, kind of a young uh, red shoulder hawk kind of hanging around. And I noticed he went to the ground. And again, you just get lucky sometimes. And so I went over there near him, and he just kind of looked at me like, uh, could interrupt me. He had nailed this green snake and it pinned it down. And uh, so anyway, I thought I'd never get a shot like that again. But, uh, so that was, that's one of my keepers. And again, this was at Merritt Island as well. And just kind of picking up. I don't know if that was a shrimp or a minute in one of the little canals there as you head out toward Cape Canal. But that's, if you go there, you probably have to go in the winter when they, a lot of the birds are, or summer, not winter there. But it's a, it's a great place to go observe birds. If you want to see. Excellent thing. All right, I guess we'll go on to uh, Henderson. Going out to Vegas now. My mother lives in uh, Vegas, and my sister lives up there. So I, I've always wanted those. That, that, that there's no lure to me to go out down. But uh, over the last three or four years, I've finally realized that there's like a bird preserve right there in Henderson, right in the middle of Henderson. So I started going out there and uh, just to walk all these trips. They got about eight, maybe eight ponds. And uh, so kind of tell you the rest of the story, they, they had that rain. This last time I went, they hadn't had rain out there in a, a year almost in Vegas. And I saw, there's one of the guys working there, I said, uh, it's a free place, you can go there and walk around all you want. Um, 
I asked the guy, I said, how do you keep water in these ponds? Well, I didn't realize these ponds are reclaimed sewage water. And uh, so basically all these people live in Henderson, they, 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 they claim the water up and pump it in these ponds. So as long as people are still flushing their commode, they've got tons of ponds in again. But uh, and, I mean, so it's kind of a neat idea when you're talking about living in the desert. And so these birds come in there and sit for the winter. So this one is probably, I think we've seen these on Shanners, black crown heron, night heron. And I just got lucky this last time and caught him in some reeds. So anyway, that's a beautiful bird. Um, go ahead. And then we've got blue gray neck catchers here, but this one's actually called a, um, I don't I got that, a black tail neck catcher. So just a little different what we might see around here, but it's this type of uh, the grasses they are brush they had kind of made a nice photo I thought. And I can't even pronounce this guy's name. Common. Somebody seems to know these birds. Like Gala Galanul or something like Galanul, but kind of like a coot, just some different colors on it. Next one. Now what my, this is actually my sister's backyard, but this is called a Costa hummingbird. So there you see a lot of them around there. She's had a nesting And this is another one I may have misidentified because there's glossy, glossy ibis, ibis and there's a white face on it. So uh, whatever one you want to think it is, you're welcome to it. But it's really a nice shot there. It's you know out the shoreline. This is at that preserve. And uh, you might see something since there's a western breed, a little bit bigger than these pipeel pipeel breeds we see around. And uh, yeah, I have to read this one too. I haven't memorized a pectoral sandpiper. That was just kind of sad. So you know, again, I get to see some different stuff. I always joke with people like I go to King's Dominion or I not push cards. They got these bird thing places, and you got a kookaburra. I said, yeah, I'll throw some of those in there, but I try not to cheat on the kookaburra sitting in a zoo or something. This is a pipeel breed. Now you do see these around here, the little small breeds. Especially over here in Lackage. And that's a snowy egret. Well, what was interesting about this bird, I went to the wrong preserve one time. They had a preserve, another preserve in Henderson that was uh, like a wildlife preserve, but it wasn't the one that they had the ponds. And then some, some homeless guy had set the woods on fire, so the whole fields and stuff were, were black. And I go out there and said, This is kind of interesting. It burnt the whole thing down. Now there's, Snowy egrets out there on a burnt limb to eat the next day. So I always thought it was kind of interesting. And again, we get the sparrows here. I think this is a white crown sparrow, which we don't really see much around here. But you see him there in Henderson. That's it. I did get a roadrunner while I was there, but it wasn't a very good picture of a roadrunner in that part. All right, Daniel, I think I'm a bit of miscellaneous. We covered the rest of them. I think we had them pretty close. And I think maybe these miscellaneous might be, be all right. We got 10 minutes still. Yeah. All right, these are just a shot. I always like to do a bit of a you know, reflection. These little birds you see along the uh, beach. I think this is called a black bill clover. Next one. One of my favorite shots is these black skimmers. I was down at Hampton Road. Hampton, wow. Hampton Roads. What's that called? Um, Buckrow Beach. And these guys were sitting out there. And so the guy in the middle over there, just so you know, he, well, that's a royal turn. And I'm looking, he's looking at me like, what am I doing with these guys? You know, <laughs> there is mask and stuff. And it's like, uh, yeah, maybe I should leave. I mean, it's like he's kind of nervous sitting with those guys. But those black skimmers are fun to watch. Uh, in there. But go ahead, next one, Daniel. I might have a bit of man. Maybe I don't. I thought I had a better shot. I had no idea what that is. No, just so that was just one of my better shots of a bluebird. Uh, I had actually captured it. It had painted a, a little more, more rust on it. So uh, I, thought, I thought we got a good one. And I thought I'd never get a shot of this, but uh, we, uh, Charlie and I, we were fans about with it too, but there's, I didn't realize there's this huge forest in Sussex called Big Woods. And so we kind of found you can ride all through there and uh, people hunt it. But you just feel it's like a state forest. And just riding by it, that, 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 uh, 
know, but uh, my well, wife just kind of stood up there for me, so I was, it added to my it added to my count. Go ahead. Now, the only reason I took this is I was at it, uh, in uh, Lake Harrison. There's old fish ponds, and down in the bottom where they're not, the ponds aren't there anymore, these little young kill deer were hidden in that. And that straw looking stuff. So I did get one that actually came out long enough for you to get a picture of that little kill deer. Excellent. Uh, you know, what's, what's unique about a kill deer? Everybody knows. Well, kill deer, kill deer. I remember at Firestone, when that parking lot was empty, if you went out there, they always nested like in like maybe a little, like a rocky area. But if you got near their nest, they would fake injury and act like they had a broken wing and try to lead you away from the yeah, so I've always thought that was kind of a neat, yeah. neat feature of it. And these are uh, Northern uh, Shovelers. And this was, uh, I think I went down at, I was down at uh, Hatters, not Hatters, P Island or somewhere. And there was one of these freak winters where everything froze over down there. Matter of fact, we ran into some National Geographic people. I was the defending that bar to Patrick and uh, National Geographic was down there filming the phenomenon because it was just, it hardly ever freezes over. And these guys walked across. I kind of thought it was good. Kind of What's that one? That my um, kind of go back to my list here. I have a warbler. Okay, these little warblers can get confusing right here, but I was lucky to get a decent show. Uh, that might be in Bidwoods too. There seems to be a lot of warblers out there that you don't normally see in the city. Next one. And then Char Charlie and I, and I, we were trying to find that day when red cockaded woodpeckers are living there, which are kind of rare. And I did run across this prairie warbler. I'm thinking, not living in the prairie, but these prairie warblers hang out down there somewhere. Just beautiful little warblers. So, anyway, you never know what you might pick up on the trail. Go ahead. Now, this is a little blurry, but over at Fort Lee, uh, it was the performatory. I, I just, he flew off the telephone pole. I got a nice picture of the red tail hawk. And another shot of a song sparrow. Go ahead. And then uh, it took me a while to figure this one out. This is a white-eyed vireo. You can't probably see the white eye, but the vireo is sort of like a little warbler, but it's got uh, it's got little white eyes, which is kind of neat. I think there's a red type version of it, right? Um, I guess that's after they spent a night at the anchor room. <laughs> anyway, uh, he obviously. Anyway, go ahead. And a yellow lumped warbler, which that was, I took that at Hog Island one day. And for some reason, that shot just stood out. And I was, I've taken a lot of yellow lumped warblers, but none of them look that nice. So, anyway. And another beautiful bird, yellow shafted uh, woodpeckers. When I went out to Vegas, I didn't get a nearer shot. They got, they got red shafted woodpeckers out there, very similar to a little different color. I do have some shots of those, too. Not as pretty as this one. Go ahead. All right. Well, I'm kind of winding down here. They paid me for like a three hour program. Getting <laughs> <laughs> messed up here. All right, so we're we down like five minutes. Uh, actually, let's go to um, number 107. See the, at the very bottom? I've got 170 species now. And Charlie Hunter and I, the elusive red cockaded woodpecker. We must have been out there, what, 10, 15 times, Charlie, trying to see if we could see that bird. And I don't have a great picture of it, but we were set, we decided we'd take, our, take some chairs and, and just sit in the woods and wait them out. And some guy said, you know, we kept hearing people that had seen them. And uh, so what about a month ago, Charlie? Well, it's an endangered uh, species. Yeah, it's endangered and probably more common maybe in Georgia and some of those. But there's these fine forests that are out there in Sussex that now they've got these protected areas. So, man, probably our last time, and I, you know, so that definitely that's my 170th species right there, a bird I've gotten. But three of them showed up and were chasing each other around the trees. And that's quite a ways away, is why it's not the greatest picture. But I just want to show you that, you know, you never know what, you're going to be, what you might add on to your list. Uh, and I didn't show you 170. I had no intention of doing that because uh, I got a lot of other stuff. But uh, I really wanted to make it maybe encourage you to pay more attention to your surroundings. Uh, let's go to number 
most beautiful. And this may, this is Johnny Jones's list, and there is a bunch of beautiful birds that you can qualify on there. And I may, these may be mixed up because I didn't label them. But, you know, if we didn't, I was telling my wife, I said, you know, if I didn't live with you every day, I, I wouldn't realize I was living with the most beautiful woman in the world because you see her every day. But if we didn't have a cardinal here that we saw all the time, and we went somewhere and saw that bird, yeah, we would probably think that's the most beautiful bird I've ever seen. So we're very fortunate to have that kind of beauty, but it's unfortunate it's in our backyard and we, we take it for granted. But even the females, I think, are incredibly uh, colored. You know, so go to the next one. And of course the males. And all of us have those hanging around. But uh, I usually get about three or four pairs. And I get, what about cardinals? If you know about cardinals, most of them mate for life. And, um, the male takes a big role in feeding the young and stuff. So the cardinal is kind of a really neat bird. Um, uh, it's fortunate we live in an area where we get to see them. Next one. And I had that shot of an eagle uh, flying over me. Sometimes you get some good sun on them. Another female cardinal. Go ahead. And this one's kind of one of my bad. I used this as a Christmas card one year for somebody maybe wrote it. I don't know. But it was just in the snow here, but, uh, just a gorgeous bird. And that was, uh, they were actually, I don't know if that was a young or they were just making out. I don't really know. <laughs> but yeah, I do try to find any erotic bird shots I can get. Yeah. So. <laughs> Debbie, my wife's going, oh, I had to go there. <laughs> anyway, so one day I was on the Shenandoah, and again, I haven't seen this happen since. I'm fishing a little. A little transition to some white water, and I was standing in it, fishing in some moving water, trying to catch small amount. And this, uh, see the wax wing just kept flying across that, and picking out bugs and blocking and stuff. And so he just kept coming back and sitting there for me. So again, one of my lucky, I call it lucky, is a favorite shot, right there. And I was in Seattle when I took this. It was out on Seattle. We were on some little walking trail, an immature one. Anyway, it's a pretty little bird. And uh, sometimes I just need to catch them standing side by side like this. And another one, this was like in my backyard. They, they, like I said, they get these little big trees with berries. They, they come in flocks too. Uh, and usually you'll see these in little flocks of like 10 to 20. It's a neat bird. I always thought this was kind of neat, you know, down in Dutch Gap, you know, you know, smoke coming up from Dutch Gap, there the eagles are set. All right, go ahead and move on. And another one, uh, it's just incredibly beautiful. And they come around, and a lot of times you don't even know that they have kind of a cat sound sometimes too, but those yellow bellied saps up there, and they love the pecan trees and maple trees and stuff. Another tree I have my, in my yards down at City Point now are hackberry trees. And you wouldn't think about a hackberry tree being valuable, which you do, but they, they produce these little berries and uh, the birds love them. So uh, I'm so glad I got these hackberries. That's the, now the prettiest tree in the world. And a tree behind me, Bubba McCutcheon has one kind of behind me, and it's a huge mulberry tree. And it, it really produced more. I've ever seen it produce this year. I mean, for the past month, that mulberry tree has had mulberries. And those birds are flocking there. So it's kind of, think about sometimes the, the kind of trees that really attract them around there. Anyway, I just like that picture. Another shot of a yeah, yellow belly sap sucker. Yeah, I think these are just one of the most beautiful. Go ahead. I caught this one trying to drill. I think there was a Spanish balloon behind that. And, uh, or was it searching for Civil War bullets, Dan? I couldn't remember. Uh, but anyway, that was, so I thought it was kind of funny. I think that see, catching that head found. I don't know if they get concussions from that. Dr. Layman, did they get concussions? Another shot of them. Just a just gorgeous bird. That's, you know, you hate to see that uh, hawk I had earlier that the male one was eating. Maybe they're tasty as well as one day. I don't know. Go ahead. That's it. Dana, can I find my thing on my phone? You got it? I'm about to read it. I don't know my password. All right. I want to read y'all something. I'm going to have to take a minute. I'm going to have to take an audio. 
but if you ask me why I do things like this, there's nature has order. You know, we live in a very disordered world. I think as human beings, we're capable of committing about any crime or sin possible. They, they don't do that. I mean, they, they, they have an order. They, you know, and I, I call it intelligent design. God created these guys to play their role. But I, I don't tell people I don't read, so you don't see me in the library. I don't even use your computer. But I read two books, Yearling and Deer Slayer by James Federal Cooper. But um, I'm going to try to read this. I'll probably get emotional. But Cooper always started every chapter in Deer Slayer with a, with a poem or something. But this one always hit me. And I said, uh, There is a pleasure in pathless woods, there is a rapture on the lonely shore. There is society where none intrudes by the deep sea and music and its roar. I love the man, I love not man the less, but nature more. For these are interviews, whoops, I should have written this out. From these are interviews in which I steal from all I may be or have been before to mingle with the universe and feel what I can ne'er express and cannot see you know thank god god gives us a glimpse of you know his glory in my opinion so thank y'all for listening i hope you enjoyed some of that